Okay, so welcome everybody to another State of the Reactor. Uh, we appreciate you being here on this lovely Friday afternoon or morning or night or wherever you are. Um, so quick little housekeeping update. Um, the current timeline is, is still on track um, and the contracts are still slated to go to audit at the end of the month. Um, Cody, is there anything you want to say about the progress for the contracts? Uh, yeah, coming along nicely. Uh, we merged in a lot of the core functionality just this week. Uh, we're kind of in the process of pulling all those pieces together and getting them, you know, getting them tied up and talking. Uh, it's a lot to it, but yeah, so far things looking good. Sweet. Um, we had a, okay, here we go. We got an update from Dan. Heads up, I can't speak if I'm recording and dropping stuff. Okay, so Dan is recording. We're all good to go on that. Uh, he just can't use his mic. Um, okay, next item on the list is the public roadmap was uh, updated this morning. So that should be more up to date. But like I said before, everything's still on track for um, what we've known is the timeline. Um, next week, we'll be kind of peeling back the veil in, in a bigger way with a, uh, a release of an extensive Medium article penned by our very own uh, Sharp. And that's going to be kind of a, a comprehensive um, medium article that covers both the autopilot and LMP side of things and also the DAO side and even some touching into some, some light tokenomic stuff, um, although some of that's still uh, ongoing. Um, and this V2 article is going to kind of kick off our coming out of stealth mode to start getting some more exposure for the upcoming product release. Um, we've been working on a marketing campaign and it's, it's pretty close to being ready to go. So once we get through launching that big medium article next week, um, we're going to start following that up with, uh, some Twitter threads and a, uh, the beginning of our pre-launch campaign, which will also have an article come out that explains what exactly that campaign is, but it's going to be utilizing a platform that is, uh, incentivizes our community to try to. Uh, spread the word. So hopefully um, that will that should be pretty effective and we're excited to get that rolling. Um, we're also working on some Discord updates to freshen up the Discord and we have a special community NFT release to celebrate the launch of the autopilot product um, and bring back some life to the leaky reactor and more details about that uh, will be forthcoming. So we're really excited about some stuff coming up. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Bruno to uh, give some reintroduction to some V2 stuff before we head into a presentation. Yeah, hi. Um, so I'll try to keep it brief as possible because I don't want to drain too much attention um, and brain span from people because this will be certainly required for the presentation that Parker will do after my part. Um, so I just wanted to like reiterate a little bit. Um, the autopilot is like our main user facing product, so to speak, and the advantages uh, to the users will be like the focus for today and the upcoming marketing push initially. Um, the DAO facing product uh, will be introduced in more depth at a later point as we go on. Um, we want to maximize the focus now initially on the parts that are like relevant to like the users, to so to speak, like retail users or the general community. Um, but um, don't be worried about this, like kind of being forgotten about, because especially for these, for this kind of DAO facing part of the product, we're like in direct contact with like the staked ETH protocols such as Lido, Swell, um, and also DEXs like newer DEX like Maverick, um, that help us like shape the product on this side to ensure like a great fit for everyone involved. Um, so as I mentioned before, like the autopilot will be um, our first product to launch. Um, and we will, with the first part of this product, focus on ETH staking derivatives. Um, so the autopilot will allow LPs to supply ETH and let Tokamak optimize their yield by auto rebalancing, not only across a set of trusted pools, but also across DEXs. Um, and this will provide a superior LP experience while giving exposure to ETH staking derivatives. Um, there's like three kind of major areas of um, Kind of advantages that the user would get from using Tokenmark versus other products would be optimized yield, 
Um, so the autopilot will dynamically optimize and auto compound your yield across a set of trusted pools and those DEXs at opportune times. So it's like as close as set as close to set and forget as it gets. Um, it'll minimize the cost, right? So there's like for you no direct like associated like gas fees in the sense that you don't have to switch your positions or compound yourself, right? So this minimization. Um, will take you will also allow like the system to take advantage of like opportunities which for the individual would be out of reach in most cases. Um, it reduces your effort um, for LPing. So generally speaking, usually if you were to LP and you wanted to exposure to have to a set of pools, you would have to constantly like monitor these pools, uh, be constantly aware of like your your frequency of like switching positions right and the associated cost. The pack differences and um, on Tokamak, you will have basically one central dashboard to just monitor what the autopilot is doing. Um, all this is still in this bigger context of providing liquidity. And the system is built in a way, as I mentioned before, in cooperation with like a lot of these stakeholders um, to enable like a much more symbiotic relationship with those um, protocols that seek liquidity. Um, so to go into a little bit more detail, so for the among a lot of the novel features that we'll have with the autopilot, we have developed a sophisticated like rebalancing logic, uh, which is one of the key features. Really differ differentiating Tokamax autopilot from like the current static yield optimizers that you find in the market, and this will also enable us to like allow for additional utility down the line. In contrast to like the current static vault strategies that you see, um, the autopilot's, autopilot rebalances, um, they take into account a set of like diverse um, variables that are specific to any asset class, right? So as we launch with like staking derivatives, the logic will beha behave differently than for potentially like other asset classes that we might launch down the line, for example, stable coins, right? Since the, since the variables, they are different. Um, so it takes into account, for example, for the staking derivatives, it takes into account the base yield, the trading fees, the additional LP incentives that might be on a pool. But it also takes into account the exchange rate, the pack changes, um, and the ETH backing of the particular um, staking derivative. So it's important to note that certain factors within the set have like interdependencies. Um, yeah, so this sounds all very complicated, and it is, um, which also illustrates, again, one of the huge value props to the LPs, having all this complexity abstracted away by the autopilot. Um, and then Tarka did a fantastic job a few weeks ago, like two weeks ago, when he presented to the team some of the extensive backtesting that uh, Sam Mahuja and himself have done on their team. So we thought it would be like great for this to be shared with the community. Uh, we'll also have a follow-up on follow -up, uh, Twitter thread about this presentation next week that we will launch um, likely after the uh, Medium article. Um, so Parker will present the findings, uh, which will also like illustrate to you like some of the inner workings of the autopilot. And we'll go into like much more detail than I just did into like the interdependencies and how these things are looked at by the autopilot. So I'll hand it over to Parker. That sounds great. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Bruno. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, can everybody see that? It's, like it's yep. currently loading. Yep. Okay, great. So uh, my name is Parker. I do research and analytics here at Tokamak. And I'm going to go over the back test results that we've done in the initial version of the LST autopilot strategy. So we've basically broken it down into uh, three parts. The first part, to go over in detail like what the problem is, opportunity that being a LP in the LST staking pools is. And so we're going to go into some risks associated with that and some technical details. Um, and so once we've laid out like what the problem is and what the opportunity is, then we're going to go into more detail of what the solution that we've come up with. And we're going to talk about a couple of important features that constraints that our autopilot takes into account. And then once we've talked about like the how the autopilot thinks about things and how it um, decides to make allocation decisions, 
Then we're going to go over the back test results of a four month period uh, that we looked at. So I'm going to start with the problem. How is how are people currently liquidity in liquid staking token pairs? So if you're providing liquidity, broadly speaking, your goal is to maximize the amount of ETH you have on a risk adjusted basis. This is hard, hard for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons why it's hard is that there's so many different places where you can actually deploy your ETH. Um, you can deploy it on Curve, you can deploy it on Balancer, you can deploy it on Uniswap v2, on v3, on Maverick. There's a variety of different protocols, and then there's a variety of different underlying tokens, and then there's different token pairs, and so it gets combinatorially very large and very difficult. It's difficult for humans to make combinatorial decisions, and so it's, it's hard to do. Um, in addition to it being hard to do at the start, it changes over time. So the best decision today might not be the best decision tomorrow, and certainly won't be the best decision a month from now. So it's a hard problem, and it changes all the time. And if you want to actually do the changes on change, chain, it's expensive because it costs gas, costs slippage, and because you constantly have to spend your time and attention on managing these individual LP positions. So. Uh, Hey, Parker, yeah. I'm so sorry. Do you mind if I interrupt real quick? Yeah. Do you think you could stop sharing and, and reshare again? There's some people that can't. I can sure. see it. Um, I think some people can see and some people can't, but maybe just do a uh, stop sharing and reshare and we'll see if sure. that happens. Cool. Uh, resharing now. I'll reshare the window instead. Maybe that'll fix it. All right. Uh, does this look good? Can people see that? It works for me. We'll I'll, I'll report back from the chat. But no, yeah. it's not working for me. Okay. Oh, some can see it now. Um. Yeah, I guess some people it's not working either. We're gonna post the the slides in the chat too. So if you can't see the stream, go to the state of the reactor chat, and we'll be posting the slides there as Parker goes through. Yeah. And then we'll also be sharing the video afterwards. Okay. So. Uh, uh, all right, so I was at high switching costs. So it's hard to do, and it costs money to change positions. It's generally difficult. And so uh, this should be familiar to anybody who's actually provided liquidity on these pools and tried to get above uh, some kind of benchmark returns. Um, so this right here part that shows the APR uh, for the different pools that we looked at in our back test over time. And as you can see, uh, they change a lot. Like there's these giant spikes. And for a while, for example, uh, one pool might be the best decision. Like for example, in the period uh, December 18th up to about the end of January, the highest return was in the balancer uh, wrap staked ETH Coinbase ETH pool. Uh, but then it ceased to be the best performing and other ones became better performing. And so if you're a human, you have to figure out, well, number one, which of these is the highest, and then like when you should switch. Like For example, uh, if you look at this purple line, uh, which is a different balancer pool, it's the balancer, uh, it's called a meta-stable pool versus a composable stable pool, but they've got the same assets in them. It has this spike in APR, and then it goes away. So do you allocate to that, or how predictable is that? And so this is difficult to do because they're hard to predict, and they change frequently. I hope to illustrate this is uh, technically challenging. Um, uh, one piece of evidence that people are doing this poorly is if you look at the uh, APR in the Curve staked ETH, ETH pool. On Curve, it's a very large pool. It has about $1.2 billion in it right now. Um, you are holding roughly half staked ETH, half ETH. And the theory is that the fees and the incentive rewards will more than make up for the lost yield in having half of your position be in ETH, which doesn't generate anything. For a while this was true. If you look at the blue line, it shows that the APR of the curve pool was higher than just holding plain staked ETH. It changed. Um, and people didn't exit the pool to make up for it. So for a long time, for like about a month, people just did not have uh, their ETH optimally allocated because they were missing out on this yield. So if a billion dollars can be misallocated, probably misallocating something. 
So people are doing it wrong and it's hard. Uh, one issue to think about in rebalancing, how much it costs to switch positions. Um, so this depends on gas costs, on what protocols you're interacting with, but if you think about five rebalances in a year, um, which is like on the very low end, expect to spend between about $120 and $1,000 on gas costs. So unless you are big enough that, that the extra API you're earning more than covers the extra gas costs, then you're just, it doesn't make any sense for you to for you to rebalance because of these fixed transaction costs associated with switching pools. So in order to even play the rebalancing game, you have to be quite large, uh, which puts it out of the range for many retail people. Um, there's other stuff you need to consider when you're being an LP in these pools. You have to think about the gas costs uh, associated with liquidating your reward token and auto and uh, auto compounding them. You have to think about the gas costs of switching between pools. You have to think about the slippage and the trading costs between going from one uh, LST token, let's say wrap staked ETH, to another LST token, like Coinbase ETH. You have to think about what's the relationship between, what's the market price of the LST token versus uh, what's the underlying ETH collateral worth. And if there's a discrepancy between those two, you have to keep that in mind. Uh, you have to understand how much exit liquidity there is for each of your underlying LST tokens. So, for example, if you're providing liquidity into a relatively new pair, and you end up being like 80% of the liquidity in the pool, and you try and exit, you're going to have a bad time. So you have to, like this is important if you're large, but you have to size yourself such that you can exit gracefully. Uh, take a huge amount of slippage when you try and go from some obscure LST back into ETH. Um, you have to pay attention to the gas costs and the attention costs of auto compounding your rewards. So if you're small and your rewards are like $100 a month, that probably you can't probably auto compound every month because it'll get all eaten by gas. So maybe you have to auto compound every three months or every six months. And so there's a lot of factors where if you're at a small size, it doesn't look like uh, it isn't a good idea to do your own rebalancing. Another feature you need to look at is the likelihood of APR stability. Is uh, You need to have some kind of confidence in the different types of APR and in what you expect them to be tomorrow. If you get this wrong, then you'll make movements where uh, the expected APR will actually go down. You need to have a good internal model of what the APRs are going to be tomorrow. And this is a kind of a less important point for LST tokens, is that you have to pay attention to impermanent loss. Like when you enter a pool, the prices, and when you leave, that you don't lose a bunch or lose a little to impermanent loss. And so these are just things that you have to think about when you're doing your own rebalancing. Autopilot does all of these things for you. That's the big value, is that it's hard. Opportunity here. There's an opportunity because the APRs are, devoid, are are varying a lot and because you don't have to do all of these things and pay all of these gas costs. So that is big picture what the value is of autopilot. So now that you know the problem that we're solving and um, the magnitude of it, I want to get into um, what uh, our autopilot thinks about in some more detail. So um, what is the autopilot's edge? So there is a value that we have called uh, the LP token discount percent. And so what this is, is the ratio between the underlying collateral value of the ETH LST is representing uh, versus the market price. So what the current price is of the LST. So for example, uh, staked ETH is always supposed to trade at one-to-one -one with ETH because it rebases one staked ETH should always be redeemable for one ETH. Uh, but occasionally, uh, and particularly during, during periods of high stress, the staked ETH uh, and any LST really will start to depeg. So uh, a couple of months ago, it was down to something like during a, a, a harsh depegging event, 3% of an ETH. So you have to pay attention to those things because if you sell when it's down 7%, you'll be missing out on upside. And you might be missing out on downside if you sell at the high or 
it, it's, a, it's an important feature to consider because if you don't consider it, you're just making suboptimal decisions. The part that I think is particularly interesting of the model is that it distinguishes and it weighs the APR components. It's easy to look at APR and see, oh, uh, this is 6% APR and this other thing is 8% APR. So obviously just do the 8% APR thing. That isn't sufficient because APR and APR are fundamentally different and they behave in different ways. And so first I'm going to show uh, a plot of the LP token discount percent over time. Uh, as you can see, if you look at the red line over here, uh, this is the balancer. Uh, composable stable pool, wrap stake ETH, and ETH pool, you can see that it was trading at a pretty heavy discount. If you look at, and what this means when I say it's trading at a discount, is that the current market price of Coinbase ETH and wrap stake ETH is less than what their collateral is. And so if you uh, enter them with the exit queue, you'll get more ETH than if you try and market sell them. Uh, then if you look at this top line over here, this blue line, it's Rocket ETH and Rapstake ETH. And one of the quirks we found um, when doing backtesting for this is that Rocket ETH consistently trades at premium above what its collateral is worth. And this is a, a quirk of the Rocket ETH system where they can't actually arbitrage it down fast enough because there are constraints on the number of new mini Rocket pools that can get spun up. It's true and valid that it can trade at above its collateral for a long period of time. In fact, for the entire backtest, uh, it traded of what its collateral is worth. And so you have to consider these things, otherwise you risk making suboptimal decisions. Um, this is a chart that shows the APR components of providing liquidity in an LST pool. Uh, we broke this up into three different parts. The first part is base APR. Base APR is the ETH you earn securing Ethereum proof of stake network. network. Uh, this is the rewards earned for the, the validators, pretty much. Um, the, so it's the blue line right here, and you can see it's a little jagged, but it's pretty stable over time with some spikes. Um, the second kind of APR is called fee APR, and this is the swap fees. It's what you earn for when somebody interacts with your pool, they lose a little bit, their value goes up over time. Swap fees uh, are different than base APR. In particular, there are massive spikes in um, fee APR during periods of stress. It goes back to zero. So the fact that there's like a large spike in APR yesterday, in fee APR yesterday, is not really good evidence that there's going to be a high spike in fee APR a week from now. So you have to treat these income streams differently because they have different averages and they have different standard deviations. And so you have to think about them differently and weigh them differently. Uh, the last type of APR is called incentive APR, and it's the APR you earn from selling your reward tokens. And so this is generally more volatile than base APR, but less volatile than fee APR, because it depends both on um, the market price of the reward token. Uh, in this case, this is the market price of the Lido token. Um, and how much people are staking and if they are cutting their emissions. So it depends on more external things um, than base APR, which fundamentally only depends on rewards from the beacon chain. So you have to treat these kinds of APR differently and the autopilot is going to do that. So I've told you about what the problem is and I've told you about what some of the components that our autopilot model actually looks at when it's making these decisions, what did we actually find after we ran these, after we ran this back test? So uh, before I get into that, I want to talk about the scope. So whenever you're doing a back test, you have to clearly define what you're actually looking at. I mentioned er earlier in the presentation about how there's a tremendous variety of different pools and LSTs that you can look at. So we had to swiftly, we had to, we had to define the set of pools that we were looking at um, that, so that we didn't like way too many pools to look at. So it was like a manageable project to do. Um, so we only looked at Ethereum, the most mature LST market. We only looked at Curve and Balancer because they were, during the periods of our backtest, the most active um, for LST pools 
We looked at four LSTs. We looked at Stake ETH, we looked at Frax ETH, we looked at Coinbase ETH, and we looked at Rocket ETH. And we only looked at a four month period between December 1 and April and April 23. We made some assumptions about slippage and gas. We assumed it to be about 17 basis points uh, on each swap. And we figured this was uh, a good summarization, good assumption uh, that would be reasonable going forward. We also got our underlying token prices from CoinGecko. And so any issues with CoinGecko, we inherited in their pricing. So for example, um, the Fraxies pool uh, was created about 12 days before CoinGecko started tracking the Fraxies price. So we miss out on a 12-day period of when Frax ETH. Uh, we could have put money into there, but we just didn't have good price data, so we just uh, didn't put anything into it instead. Um, this is a chart that shows where we were allocated over time, um, in which pools. So you can see there's gradual changes. Like we start off for the back test primarily in uh, Curve Staked ETH ETH. We go into Balancer, wrap staked ETH, ETH, to balancer, wrap staked ETH, Coinbase ETH. Up in those two pools for a while before gradually going into a different balancer pool for balancer, wrap staked ETH, Coinbase ETH. And then at the end, we just put a tiny bit inside of the staked Frax ETH, wrap staked ETH, and Rocket ETH pool and balancer. And so here you can see that the autopilot is making decisions and it is changing its allocations over time to get a better return. Um, its investment rather than purely staying in a uh, curve stake thief. Uh, these two charts show the growth in the market value of our portfolio over time and the growth in the underlying value, so the actual collateral of our strategy over time. He outperformed both uh, net asset value, so the current market value of our portfolio, and in the underlying collateral value, if we were to pull everything out and enter the exit queue, what would we have gotten? Um, so this is primarily to validate that this kind of strategy over our backtest window could have been profitable. Uh, there are a variety of features that make us think that this kind of strategy will make more sense and be more profitable in the future. Um, but this was primarily to validate that pull the on-chain data and make decisions that would have outperformed the benchmark. Uh, the benchmark that we picked, by the way, was the Curve Staked ETH ETH pool that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we picked that because it was the largest. And it is kind of a good default position for being a liquidity provider because it's just so much larger than everything else. Uh, what are the results? So if you look at the annualized returns over that four month period, so we just take the difference in returns and multiply them by three, you can see that our strategy uh, was 2.4% increased return of net asset value compared to the benchmark and had a 4.5% increase return in the underlying collateral of their ETH. So, this is promising, and there are some reasons why we believe it'll be more promising in the future. Um, for example, our back test did not include Maverick. And Maverick, uh, there's uh, basically, as you add more options for the autopilot to choose from, it'll necessarily make better decisions. If you give it an option, it's just terrible, it's not gonna do anything with it. So as you give it more things to play with, it can only improve over time. So these are the results that we found. And uh, it's, we find it compelling, and we think that uh, we validated that this kind of strategy can work over our backtest window. And so uh, that's the presentation, and now I can answer any questions if you have them. Let's look at the chat. There. Yeah, thanks for that, Parker. That's awesome. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can ask them in the state of the reactor chat now. In the meantime, um, how, does anybody else from the uh, team so have, the question is, have anything to comment on? the question is, how easy is it to replicate your to comment on? 
Um, well, the contracts aren't done, so that's kind of hard to answer. Um, I under, my understanding is that we're open sourcing, all like we're publishing the actual contracts themselves. So it seems there 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 are there are scale issues. Um, I think it's probably easy to copy and paste the code, but it's difficult to like get all of the parts, the off-chain parts working. I think there's there's some more to this too. There are some off-chain pieces that will be um, executed by a solver, kind of like a keeper um, that the devs can talk to us more about. And then there are still some open questions about if we might have some kind of license associated with the contracts similar to what Uniswap ha has done that might um, you know, provide for folks who <laughs> follow those licenses, some sort of, um, you know, moat around the complete copying of the th kinds of things that we've built here. Um, but that's a good question and, and we'll be able to share more on our strategy around that as we get closer to launch. I think we'll just give it a minute here, see if there's any other questions. BPS I'll, I'll add in while some of the other folks might be digesting and raising some more questions. Um, there's a, so much good stuff in here. Thank you, Parker and Sam and Ahuja, uh, our crack analytics team um, who have put a lot of work into identifying this opportunity and the specific strategy and then back testing it. Um, there's a lot of work and validation that's gone into this that I think is delivering some pretty exciting results for people who are looking for return on their ETH. And um, just to kind of reiterate, one of the things that Parker had said at the end is that this really looks at a constrained set of opportunities. It's two DEXs, it's a set of LSTs which are more established. And so I think the strategy might be considered by some folks to be conservative and will enable people to seek this opportunity that we've outlaid here or laid out here. And then um, as we look forward, uh, there's a lot of interest in what may be an LST summer. Um, we have a lot of, of LSTs that are coming online. All of them will need liquidity. And there will be, I think, a a little bit of a competition to source that liquidity. And so what we should see is a lot of opportunities for LPs to find attractive APRs in, um, in protocols that they trust and in DEXs that they trust. And so we may see more opportunities, more pools than the ones we've, we've identified here, which might have more attractive return profiles given the um, kind of nascency of those protocols and their need to attract LPs who um, who aren't familiar with that um, protocol itself, but might be attracted by a high APR to learn more and decide to LP. So um, there's a lot coming. I think this this strategy here can be applied to both a conservative strategy and a uh, and a more aggressive strategy with more. Um, with newer LSTs that come online. It should be fun to see, and we'll backtest all of that, and you'll be able to see some of those results as we get closer to launch. Yep, and, and one thing that I just wanted to reiterate here, because I think it was pretty heavy presentation. There was like a lot of content here to digest. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that, as mentioned before, this is, this is basically the kind of the LP-facing part of the, of the overall tokenmark vision. There is the uh, DAO facing product, uh, which is just as kind of uh, sophisticated or, or complex, um, which I'm really tempted to talk about right now. But I think in order to like not um, kind of mix up these things now and get people confused, um, we'll, we'll stay on the RP side. But um, as mentioned also earlier, on Tuesday, we will be launching the Medium article, 
which will also go into like much more depth on the DAO side of things so that you might be able to get like a more comprehensive view of the overall vision. Maybe one more thing that I would uh, maybe add to the, um, to the model as we've described it right now is that each of these components uh, are pretty um, extensive and we are you know, working on improvements on each of them. For example, how each of the APRs are treated is, um, is a big design space and, and you could you know, have additional enhancements that uh, you know, would further improve the reliability of uh, the signals that we are basing the rebalancing decision on. So we're taking into account rebalancing cost and reliability of the signals. Uh, so there's there's much more to this, and you know we'll keep iterating and sharing results. Awesome. Any anything else from uh, from the team before we? kind of wrap this up. I know that was a pretty heavy presentation, but again, we're going to drop the, actually, I think the PDF is already dropped in the state of the reactor chat. Um, and then we'll also release the uh, recording and the visual recording of, of the call. Um, cool. Anything else? Oh yeah, there is another chat. Tell me. Oh yeah, if there's any other question you can bring up. Otherwise I was going to say, um, all of this, I think, um, to the user, to the actual LP, is going to be a very simple experience. So while well, that's a lot to digest and is super exciting, and Parker and, and a number of people on the team here have worked really hard to uh, understand all this complexity, to the user, it will be as simple as I have ETH, I deposit it, and then the autopilot takes care of the rest. So just wanted to mention that as well. But I think there is a question on on how we might attract people who are currently LPing, uh, specifically Curve, um, and and this is something that we've we've talked about. The the one challenge with it is that um, they likely have a token that that is not part of the the constituents that we want to be deployed to at that moment, and so there would be some sell pressure right in getting out of, for example, Steeth and moving into whatever the the pools are that um, that are providing the higher APRs. Uh, but it is definitely something that we're looking at. Um, how can we kind of run campaigns to attract people that are currently kind of doing the inefficient version? Okay, cool. And I will uh, wrap it up then. Think, but there's one more thing that we wanted to announce is that um, we're aiming towards the end of next week to release um, beta access to our new marketing site for uh, for the Discord only. It'll be password protected, and then we'll we'll shortly go fully live with that um, shortly after we release it for you guys. Take a look at it, give some feedback, and. Um, yeah, so look forward to that uh, the end of next week. Um, and yeah, anything else? I mean, I it should always be said that, you know, the numbers that the backtesting is, is showing are very significant outperformance uh, versus like what you would call the benchmark. Obviously, that's in the charts, but I think it should be said. Great point. Yeah, this this will give significantly higher yield than what anyone is able to if they just uh, choose one and kind of go themselves, or if they attempt to manage this complex process. So well, it's going to be very that's compelling. That's campaign, right? Like it, it works. Um, <clears throat> that's something that I think we we should always lead with that. As uh, as technical as this is, it works. And I think the decision, as the set grows bigger, as you have more pools coming in, the decision gets hard, harder for humans. And I think you know that's where sort of having automated strategy that looks at all these parameters, I think, um, you know, will shine even more.
All right. Well, this is very exciting. Um, thanks for everybody to for joining the uh, the, the uh, chat today, and um, we're looking forward to getting out that medium article next week. So uh, I think Bruno did kind of mention we're aiming for Tuesday release for that article. So be on the lookout for that. That's going to be pretty comprehensive, and that'll give you um, quite a bit of time to to kind of read it and reread it and kind of digest what what's coming up next for Tokomac. So. We're really excited and we appreciate appreciate everybody for for hanging with us and um, yeah, looking forward to what's coming next. So thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Awesome. Thanks guys. Thanks everyone. Thanks out.